The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Well, tonight we're with Jesus and the Twelve in the large upper room in Jerusalem, furnished and made ready. Tonight we are at the Last Supper with him. Night has fallen and there is a sense of mounting menace. Judas will slip out into the night and alert Jesus' enemies to his whereabouts. And the squad of soldiers will put on weapons, take up clubs, prepare their lanterns and torches, ready to set out on the errand of arrest. And meanwhile, the city is settling down to sleep. Jesus, in the upper room, knows his hour has come. And in these last few free hours with his friends, he invests everything. He pours his whole self out. There's a luminous intensity to this upper room. The light is shining in the darkness. This is Jesus' last Passover with his disciples, perhaps anticipating the actual feast by one day, so some people think. This is his last great discourse found in chapters 13 to 16 of St. John, which is, with the Sermon on the Mount, the longest single stretch of Jesus' teaching the Gospels give us. This is the night when he gives the new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. This is the night he prays the high priestly prayer found in John 17, Father, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. And this is the night, as we just heard, when he washes the feet of his disciples, the servant king. And most of all, literally incorporating all of this, it's the night he takes bread and wine and does so simple, extraordinary things with them, thanks to which we have the mass, thanks to which we're here tonight. It's the night he commands the apostles, do this in memory of me, and so empowers them to be what we call priests. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. How well those words of St. John fit this night. When Jesus, shortly after the Last Supper, is arrested in the garden, he says, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Yes, the power of darkness closes in on him and seems to seize and overcome him. But in the Eucharist, Jesus has already lit the fuse of his resurrection and the resurrection is the victory of light. In the Eucharist, Jesus has already passed from this world to the Father, and the darkness cannot overcome him. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So said the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas in a poem inspired by his dying father. Do not go gentle into that good night. But Jesus does go gentle into a very evil night like a lamb led to the slaughter. He's a young man about to be cut down in his prime and he doesn't rage, rage, against the dying of the light. He doesn't have to, because in the upper room, he has already signaled what is really going on. He has undermined the darkness already with his light. 
he has made it clear that though it seems to be, the darkness is not in charge. He has taken bread and taken wine, the gesture that lives on in our offertory. He has thanked and blessed God, a prayer that lives on in the great Eucharistic prayers of the Mass. He has said, this is my body which will be given up for you, and this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, words that echo at every consecration. And he has broken and given the bread and shared the chalice as he does among us at Holy Communion. And he has said to the apostles, do this in memory of me. Tomorrow, we recall the passion of Christ, what he undergoes. Tonight, his action, what he does. Tomorrow, we see him simply almost as the victim. But tonight, he is the priest. Tonight, in the Eucharist, Jesus shows us the real inside meaning of all that will happen on Good Friday. He's giving another account of it, the true one, the one that springs from inside himself. He is the truth. He isn't a passive victim. He's not just another casualty of human injustice. He's passing from this world to the Father, opening the road from death to life for all of us. He's the Lord of creation, taking the fruit of the earth and work of human hands into his own hands and transforming, transubstantiating them into himself. He's the high priest coming before God, not with animals and their blood, but with his body and blood, giving his life for the ransom of many, taking away our sins, sealing the new and eternal covenant, creating peace and reconciliation. He's the one who's so great he can make himself small and through a morsel of bread and a sip of wine entwine his life with ours, making a brotherhood, a solidarity, a unity hitherto undreamed of and unleashing a whole new brand of love, love to the end. He's the one who, as Pope Benedict inspiringly put it, gave thanks tonight, he gave thanks that his prayer was heard, gave thanks in advance that the Father did not abandon him to death, gave thanks for the gift of the resurrection, and on that basis could already give his body and blood in the form of bread and wine as a pledge of resurrection and eternal life. This is what is happening tonight. This is the light that's lit. This is what lives on in the Mass. And though Jesus and his friends will go downstairs and out into the night and on into the garden, though a great sadness will fall on him, though the tramp of boots will sound through the olive trees, the powers of darkness have already lost. They're too late. Isn't it extraordinary? the gentle means our servant king chooses. Bread and wine and a few words and men as fickle as the apostles. Yet by these means, on a thousand altars, the light is always being lit as it has for 2,000 years. Yesterday, a few of us were interviewing two fine young men hoping to join the three we already have in seminary, and become priests in this diocese, and therefore joining our 30 or so active priests. Time will tell whether this is their way, but pray for them, pray for many more. There could be 20 times as many, why not? But on such frail lampstands does the light shine. Shine, though, it does. Imagine our Catholic life without the Eucharist. Imagine the world without the Mass. 
Imagine Christianity without it. It turns so pale. The Mass, the Eucharist, it's the great sign in time, generation after generation, of the victory of light over darkness. It means that peace and unity and freedom and reconciliation are not just nice words in UN or EU documents, political rhetoric but actually have a form and a name and times and places in the world. They exist as the body of Christ in every sense. The Eucharist is a sign of unity, the bond of charity. It's the great reassurance when darkness invades our lives. It's what can keep us loving when we'd rather shut our loving down opens our eyes to Christ in unlikely places, in the bodies of the suffering. It makes our whole life a Passover and a prayer. It can give an unexpected wholeness to what we do. It's the medicine of immortality and the pledge of resurrection. It's the sign that he is among us. It is him. It is the light shining in the darkness. Tonight we're giving thanks for this measureless gift and tonight we pray for priests past, present and to come and we ask for the humble grandeur of Jesus. <laughs>